Good morning, Dr. Desmond. All right, let's get started. So this is, uh, like I said, part one of molecular basis of melanoma, and I have no disclosures. So there are many different types of melanocytic nevi that can histopathologically simulate melanoma and vice versa. And the diagnostic discordance between dermatopathologists for melanocytic lesions has been estimated to be up to 25%, which is pretty surprising, right? And due to medical legal risks, there's basically an incentive to push the diagnosis towards melanoma. And while this may decrease mortality associated with melanoma, it can increase morbidity as well as costs, okay, for the patient. Unnecessary, you know, wide excision, sentinel lymph node dissections, um, various types of medical therapy, and then, you know, even just some emotional stress from having a diagnosis of melanoma. Even like life insurance policies, you know. So, even going back maybe about half a century ago at this point, you know, the you know, four main melanoma subtypes were established based upon clinical parameters as well as histopathological features, okay? And the most common type is superficial spreading melanoma here, this SSMM. And it's characterized, it always has a radial growth phase. So radial growth phase essentially is analogous to like melanoma in situ, but you may have some mel uh, melanocytes within the superficial dermis. But the concept is that it's growing you know, radially along the epidermal surface, like laterally versus invading deep, okay? So radial growth phase melanomas are thought to um, have limited metastatic uh, capacity, whereas a vertical growth phase, when it starts growing down deep into the dermis, that's where the melanoma has acquired the capacity for uh, um, metastasis and obviously then death from disease. So um, these melanomas always have a, you know, start with a radial growth phase, they're associated with intermittent sun exposure, okay? So, you know, one or two really bad sunburns throughout your lifetime. And um, most commonly occur like on the trunk, okay? The back, the upper thighs, okay? And, 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 they, and this is the kind of melanoma that is associated or tends to arise within association with a um, um, melanocytic nevus, okay? So this is the morphology of superficial spreading type melanoma. You can see you have these very large nests that kind of consumes the epidermis areas of confluent melanocytic growth, but then really you know, very striking here are these kind of just scattered pagetoid melanocytes scattered, you know, above the epidermal surface, this kind of so-called buckshot scatter, okay? It's very characteristic of this type of melanoma. Led to go malignant melanomas. These melanomas have a very prolonged radial growth phase. So a lot of times they can have a very extensive kind of, you know, um, a surgical defect by their removal but they tend to have a very prolonged real growth phase before um, moving into the vertical growth phase. Okay, so a lot of times they're, if you catch them, you know, a lot of times they have more of a surgical, like it's a defect issue than they are um, a, um, risk for metastasis. So a lot of times when you catch them, they're not really invasive, or if they are, they're thinly invasive, but obviously not in all cases. These melanomas do not arise in association with nevi, okay? And they tend to occur on the face. So areas of really intense chronic sun exposure on the face, maybe the hands or the, like the proximal forearm, you know, the proximal arms forearms. Um, you can see here, you know, these, this proliferation is characterized by a single file lentiginous proliferation of these atypical melanocytes along the basal layer. So just kind of like a single file line along the basal layer. And you may or may not have um, pagetoid descent of these melanocytes in this type of melanoma. The melanocytes actually in this type of melanoma are also more of, a, of a, more of a dendritic morphology. You can see here more of like a spindle or dendritic morphology compared to the melanocytes and superficial spreading type, which are more round and epithelioid. Acrolentigious melanomas, these obviously occur in the palms and soles and subungual locations. They also always start with a radial growth phase. And obviously there's no association with sun exposure. These are typically sun protected sites. You kind of have like a mixture between a lentiginous and a nested pattern, okay? So, you know, single file proliferation, these very abnormal um, melanocytes with a dendritic morphology along the basal layer. But you may also have, you know, pagetoid scatter throughout the epidermis and even um, like nest formation. And then lastly is your nodular melanomas. These melanomas actually can occur anywhere. They don't necessarily have a real strong association with like sun exposure. Um, they can occur in sun, chronically sun damaged or in, you know, intermittently sun damaged sites. Um, and they, the key thing about nodular melanomas is that basically they skip the radial growth phase. Okay. So they're almost like de novo invasive vertical growth phase melanomas. And so they tend to grow pretty quickly. 
And so these are the melanomas that patients, when they present, a lot of times present with advanced stage, um, at least pathological T stage in terms of breast load thickness, is usually the melanoma, the nodular melanoma subtype. Okay. So making a diagnosis of uh, of a you know, melanocytic lesion. Okay, is it black and white? Is it always easy? This is a benign nevus versus a melanoma. Well, the answer is like no, not even close. Okay, melanoma is probably one of the most heterogeneous tumors um, in humans from a morphologic standpoint, and turns out it's also probably one of the most heterogeneous from a molecular standpoint as well. All right, and so what we end up doing, you know, is at the end of the day, honesty is always the best policy, right? So, you know. Unfortunately, this ends up in us giving kind of this gradation system, you know, benign nevus, dysplastic nevus, a typical, you know, lesion, a typical is kind of equivocal. I can't say one way or the other, it's benign or malignant, treat it as malignant or just overtly melanoma. Same thing for these like lentiginous lesions here, you know, benign photoactivation or melanocytes. Maybe a patient has like lots of chronic sun damage, but it's not melanoma. What if the melanocytes are atypical, but the density is not high enough to call it melanoma, right? then all the way up to lentigo malignant type melanoma. And the same concept just applies throughout, even dermal-based melanocytic lesions, blue nevi, various subtypes, a typical blue nevus, the very rare malignant blue nevus or melanoma with blue nevus-like features. And um, even for benign dermal nevi, you can have what's referred to as um, these nevoid melanomas that can actually arise, they're very rare, but they can arise within the dermis um, lacking in, you know, an overall, uh, an overlying junctional component. And minimal deviation melanoma is kind of this category in between. And that's not even talking about spitzoid lesions, okay? So spitzoid lesions, I mean, it's the most diagnostically ambiguous category of all melanocytic tumors. And there's the benign spitz nevus. I mean, when is it safe to use the term spitz nevus? A lot of people say, you know, in children less than 10 years of age, and, and there's no morphological criteria wrong with it. Okay, if that's the case, fine. We can call that one tumor spitz nevus. But for the most part, you know, people tend to now categorize these tumors at least into atypical spitz tumor category and kind of risk, uh, you know, grade them from low risk to high risk in terms of aggressive biological behavior. Then lastly, we've got spitzoid melanomas. So again, this can all be very challenging. And then what does a dermatologist do when they get, you know, one of these reports? They may not understand what you're actually communicating to them in terms of the, the true risk. So maybe it's not always clear cut. So how can we apply adjunct diagnostic technology to really kind of enhance or, conf you know, or confirm our assumptions about how the behavior of this tumor based on histomorphology? Well, histomorphology will still and most likely will always be the gold standard in diagnosing melanocytic lesions. But what are the genetic differences between malignant melanoma and benign nevi? And can molecular pathology be applied to these lesions on a routine clinical basis? So let's just do real quickly, have a quick just uh, review on CGH and FISH, how it works, pros and cons, okay? So comparative genomic hybridization, you get the total tumor DNA is extracted and labeled with different fluorochromes. And basically this is kind of using, it uses a grind and find kind of um, a method where you basically take the patient's tumor on the side, you're gonna scrape it off, okay, into an aliquot, that's gonna contain fibroblasts, keratinocytes, inflammatory cells, and in, in addition to the tumor. And all that DNA then is, like I said, is gonna be labeled with a with different fluorochromes. And then it'll be hybridized with either normal metaphase cells, such as is the case with classic CGH, or now more commonly um, to a microarray of mapped clones and uh, array CGH. And copy number gains and losses will be identified through variations in the intensity of the fluorescent signal. You can see here, basically, here's the tumor DNA here. This is the, the kind of the control or the match, right? And you can see when you get this kind of spike, you can see there's an amplification in this portion of the chromosome. Whereas over here, where it dips down below the red, there's a deletion, okay, or a loss of that portion of the chromosome. And so the pros for using CGH is that it's an it's excellent method for detecting copy number changes throughout the entire genome, okay? And also, it's really good at identifying small amplifications and deletions. The problems with CGH is that it's got limited sensitivity. Um, if copy number changes are present only a minor subpopulation of the total tumor, they may not be detected. And this actually can be a problem with tumors that are, you know, very heterogeneous from a molecular standpoint, like melanoma. Okay, so you may not be able to detect something um, just because, you know, maybe only minor clones that were scraped that aliquot have that chromosomal abnormality. 
okay, won't, won't be picked up. You basically need about a third of the tumor to harbor the copy number change to be recognizable by CGH. Okay, so sensitivity is the major drawback for CGH. In addition to the fact that you don't have, you know, kind of um, spatial, um, you know, um, representation as to what, you know, what areas harbor those chromosomal abnormalities. It's all kind of just scraped into a grind and find, right, into an aliquot. Whereas fish targets individual chromosomes or specific regions within a chromosome. You know, fluorescence labeled oligonucleotide probes bind to their complementary DNA sequence and label that region, and therefore it's visualized under the microscope. In this, in this case, you, know, you actually have intact morphology. You can compare various regions, okay, with, with you know, fish signals with the H&E, okay? It's not grind and find. And the two types of probes that are most frequently used for melanocytic tubers are the centromeric probes, like here, these are basically used as enumeration probes, almost like a control. If you're gonna look at, you know, say, um, you know, um, the P and the Q arm on a chromosome, you want to have a centromeric probe to kind of show you gains and losses for relative gains and losses in, in comparison. Okay, and then you also can have allelic specific probes that will bind to specific genes, such as uh, cyclin D1 on chromosome 11Q or CDK and 2A on 9P21. This is the, um, the gene that uh, produces the P16 tumor, tumor suppressor protein. So the pros of fish is that fish only requires a small amount of tissue. Um, it's, it can easily be performed on paraffin embedded tissue and it permits detection of abnormal subpopulations within a heterogeneous tissue mixture because again, it's on the glass slide still. Okay, you're not, you're not, you're not scraping it off, you're actually staining, it's just an extra stain essentially, you know, what you're, what you're doing. Um, and visual, so therefore you have visual correlation between the cytomorphology and abnormal number of chromosomes. It's very helpful. The cons is that fish targets only specific chromosomes. I mean, it's probe dependent. If you're not using the right probe set, you're not gonna find the, what, you know, the, the right um, um, uh, abnormalities. And also there's inherent limitations in test sensitivity and specificity, which is, pretty much largely due to, it's like user dependent, okay, technician dependent, and we'll discuss that more at the end. Um, so let's go back all the way to like 91. This is actually a great paper, I, I, I thought, that really kind of shows the concept of how various genes can kind of drive histomorphology and it kind of correlates, okay, especially with melanocytic tumors. And so in this paper back in 91, the, these um, investigators um, differentially transfected murine melanoma cell lines. And basically what happened was that transfection of these various oncogenes actually drastically changed the cytomorphology of the melanocytes. So HRAS made the melanocytes take on this very large epithelioid-like appearance, um, new um, induced spindle cell morphology, and MYC, not surprisingly, it's probably the most potent oncogene, right? Um, induced an anaplastic cytomorphology. And, you know, we know of all these various mutations that are associated with benign nevi. BRAF is present in acquired nevi and in dysplastic nevi, NRAS in congenital nevi, HRAS in spitz nevi, um, and GNAC in blue nevi. But the problem with this is that, guess what? These mutations are also present in corresponding melanoma subtypes for the most part. Okay, so we really don't have a specific mutation at this point that can tell you definitively, yes, this is melanoma or, or not, just from a single mutation standpoint, which again, makes sense. These tumors are extraordinarily heterogeneous, right? You're not gonna just have one marker. It's gonna help you tell, tease, tease, tease out the difference. So um, basically, based on CGH and DNA micro, microarray technology, it's established that 95% of melanomas have chromosomal aberrations, whereas benign nevi lack chromosomal abnormalities. And if they do have chromosomal abnormalities, they're very restricted, okay? They don't overlap with a type seen in melanoma. And specifically, the most, I guess, notorious or most famous one at this point, or well-established one, is that 20% of spitz nevi can have gains in isochromosome 11P. And that's the part of the chromosome that contains the HRAS oncogene. And this aberration is not seen in spitzoid melanomas, okay? So if you actually have an HRAS um, or if you have gains in, uh, um, in 11P, um, that's actually in a, in a spitzoid tumor, it's actually like kind of confirmatory that it's not a spitzoid melanoma. We'll get more to that later. 
And the reason why frequent chromosomal aberrations are seen in melanoma and not in nevi is due to increased cell cycle control in nevi. So what happens is, you know, you get this kind of initial initiating driver mutation by, you know, say BRAF or NRAS. And what's going to happen is the cells are going to divide, 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 and divide, and the tumor grows to a certain size. But the, importantly is tumor suppressor mechanisms are going to kick in. Right? You have upregulation of P53, RB, P16, and that's going to cause the cells to stop dividing, okay, and then basically mature. And that's how you have a nevus. I mean, nevus, a benign tumor grows to a certain size and stops, right? If it doesn't stop and it keeps growing, it's not benign. It's malignant, okay? And that's very important because in adult stem cells, if you remember, you know, the adult stem cells don't have um, – or I should say adult stem cells have a finite capacity for replication, okay? So every time the cell divides, the telomeres get a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter. So if you have a proliferation that's growing and growing and growing, what can happen is you need that, that, that tumor suppressor function to kick in to kind of put the brakes on the proliferation to prevent the telomeres from being lost completely, okay? And that's actually what nicely explains your common acquired nevus. The, you know, the proliferation starts in the epidermis, the cells grow out peripherally in a, in a radial growth phase, starts out as a junctional nevus, and what happens, it'll migrate out, you know, peripherally or radially, stop dividing, and then the lesion, then the cells drop down into the dermis, okay, and mature. And that descent from junctional to compound to dermal nevus um, is basically a sign of, of intact tumor suppressor function and so-called maturation with dermal descent or, or, or differentiation. And the melanocytes transform from type A, I don't know what happened here, a mailbox and a film wheel, but um, it's supposed to be arrows. <laughs> but you migrate basically from type A, okay, which is basically larger cells that contain pigment to type B, which are smaller and have just these, you know, kind of hyperchromatic nuclei, very little cytoplasm, reminiscent of like a lymphocyte almost. And then type C, which is not really present here, but type C is more like a nerve sheath or spindle cell morphology. And it's very reassuring. You see that. I'm not worried that, that this tumor is melanoma, okay? And most importantly, the melanocytes within the dermis really shouldn't have dermal mitotic activity, all right? There's no, my, the absence of mitotic activity confirms that basically these cells are, are no longer dividing. And hence, this is, this is what defines senescence, okay? And senescence is defined as an essential mechanism that prevents cellular division beyond a critically shortened telomere length, okay? And it's, again, it's, caused by upregulation of tumor suppressor genes, P53, RB pathway. And these will permanently arrest the cell. However, if you've got, if you have mutations in these tumor suppressor genes, right, the cells can basically replicate beyond their critically shortened telomere length and place the cells in crisis, okay? So crisis is when cells carry on division but show high rates of apoptosis. And this is actually when you have open DNA ends and end-to-end -end fusion of chromatids. And so once your telomeres are gone, all these kind of sticky frayed you know, chromatin ends will bind to each other. And you kind of have this cascade of progressive chromosomal abnormalities that occur, okay? And actually what's interesting is that, you know, maybe you know, hypothetically regression in melanocytic lesions, which we attribute to immunological response, may be a reflection of this phenomenon, who knows? So you can see here, basically you've got chrom you know, oncogenic driver mutation, if tumor suppressor function is compromised, you're going to have chromosomal rearranging here, and eventually a stable clone will arise, right? That is melanoma. And then the patient basically, you know, the tumor keeps growing and growing infinitely um, and forms a, a, a malignant melanoma. And in certain conditions like, like um, so-called um, dysplastic nevus syndrome, there are patients that have familial or germline um, mutations and tumor suppressor genes. Okay, so they actually may, and that, that actually probably explains why a lot of some sometimes you get these like de novo melanomas that don't arise within benign nevi. They're just kind of on their own, instantaneous. And it's probably because the patient already lacks the tumor suppressor function; it's already been compromised. And once they gain this oncogenic driver mutation, the tumor goes straight to melanoma. Okay, but in a lot of cases, okay. Uh, what happens is you've got the, you know, you get the oncogenic driver mutation, say BRAF and a dysplastic nevus. Checkpoint, you know, tumor suppressor function is intact. The cell grows, uh, the cells grow to a certain, um, um, sp well, you know, span and you have a certain tumor uh, uh, size. Now what happens is over time, maybe those tumor suppressor genes may be compromised at a later date. 
And that's how melanoma can arise within a dysplastic nevus or a common acquired nevus. Okay. And interestingly, that's why, you know, the so-called dysplastic nevus, all right, which it has, you know, this kind of controversial association with melanomas, which we're teasing out the significance of what this means now more with molecular um, evidence. But for the most part, in terms of acquired dysplastic nevi, you know, one of the main features for dysplastic nevus is this kind of junctional or lateral shoulder, okay? Whereas the common acquired nevus kind of grows out radially, stops in the entire lesion, just drops down into the dermis. The dysplastic nevus actually, the radial component moves out outwards, and then obviously the cells drop down into the dermis and mature, but the radial component in the epidermis keeps going. The radial growth phase, the radial shoulder keeps growing. And maybe, all right, maybe some kind of genetic event occurred here, all right, that's different from here, that, you know, so maybe some kind of compromise of tumor suppressor function that's allowing these cells to continue dividing. All right, and that's why, and a lot of times on a shave biopsy, this is the portion that extends to the, the tissue edges. So you potentially you're leaving behind the worst part of the lesion. If there is something to worry about, you're leaving behind, you're leaving it behind on the biopsy. And that's why, you know, again, it's more, I guess, just kind of incentive to, um, granted, it's, it's largely theoretical at this point, but to, you know, re-excise moderately or severely dysplastic nevi because of that region. This is the area, the shoulder is the most worrisome area. And a lot of times, in dysplastic nevi, the um, cytologic atypia is enhanced in the shoulder compared to the central portions of the, 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 uh, the tumor. So this is a very important paper. Um, it was published in New England Journal of Medicine, I guess about 11 years ago now, um, which they evaluated 126 melanomas for genome-wide alterations using CGH, and then also looked at B, BRAF and NRAS mutations. And they lumped their melanomas into four categories, chronic sun damaged skin, um, without cro without chronic sun damage or you know or intermittent sun exposure, and then some protected sites like acral and mucosal melanomas. And what they found was with for the chronic sun damage melanomas, the vast majority of them lacked BRAF or NRAS mutations. Okay, but not surprisingly, guess where they, they most commonly occurred on the face, okay, the head, head and neck area, and so. If you think about it, you know, this is analogous to your lentigo malignant melanomas. If you remember, that's the kind of melanoma that, that does not arise in association with nevi, right? So it makes sense that maybe you, you're not going to have BRAF or NRAS mutations. Whereas the melanomas that occurred in intermittent sun exposure, okay, so one or two really bad sunburns here and there, 81% of these melanomas had either BRAF or NRAS mutations. And again, not surprisingly, these melanomas occurred on the trunk, upper, and the legs, okay? So more analogous to superficial spreading type melanoma. And what was surprisingly is that the melanomas that occurred in the uh, in some protected locations like acral and mucosal, these actually had the largest number of chromosomal abnormalities, okay? The worst mutation profile in terms of a chromosomal standpoint. Um, mucosal more than acral. And um, and again, was it also interesting is that basically these chromosomal abnormalities um, were divergent. They didn't overlap. They were distinct from one another. So after this, uh, so in this paper here by um, Casorzo's group, they tried to see, you know, is, can we demonstrate a progression, a stepwise progression from precursor lesion to nevus to, you know, radial growth phase melanoma, vertical growth phase, and metastasis, and by using fish. And they looked at chromosomes 6, 7, 9, and 10, and none of their benign nevi, 30 of them, um, had alterations in uh, chromosomes uh, 6, 9, and 10, and one case had monosomy of chromosome 7, just, you know, loss of one copy. But when they looked at the re-excisions of their melanomas, okay, melanomas, you know, that arose within a, a benign nevus, the benign nevus component, okay, in that lesion, 56% of those tumors had loss of 9P21, okay, that's the P16 correspondent, all right? Same thing with dysplastic nevi. And what you find is all, you know, there's a stepwise progression to chromosomal abnormalities, um, basically from, you know, the benign nevus component to the vertical growth phase melanoma. So by 2006, basically it was, it's been, it was established that although nevi and melanoma share initiating genetic alterations, such as oncogenic mutations in BRAF and NRAS, Melanomas exhibit drastically different clonal chromosomal aberrations, uh, most notably um, losses in 6Q, 8P, 9P, and 10Q, 
and gains in 1Q, 6P, 7, 8Q, 17Q, and 20Q. So um, a large, you know, a large list, really. Okay. Again, that makes sense. It's a better, a very heterogeneous type of, of tumor. And the exception to this rule is about 20% of Spitz nevi have gains in isochromosome 11P, an aberration that's not seen in Spitzoid melanomas. Another important feature, too, is that spitz nevi may also exhibit loss of chromosome 3, and this loss may also be seen in melanoma, so it has limited kind of diagnostic value, and if used in the right proper context. So next, what happened was the Jerami and Bastion's group, basically, they, with all this information, you know, they were, you know, they were, you know, had the idea, can we put together a, a set of probes, okay, like a, a combination of probes that can be diagnostic in, in terms of distinguishing melanoma from benign nevi, okay? And they used data on existing DNA copy number alterations in melanoma to assemble panels of fish probes, 309, uh, 301 cases. And they validated the algorithm. They basically had two training sets. And then they validated the algorithm on an independent set of 169 benign nevi and melanomas, as well as 27 ambiguous melanocytic lesions with follow-up data, which is really important. And so this is cohort one and two, they're, they're, they're training sets. This is like a sample, like an example of the initial probe list that they used. And they use epifluorescent microscope with single band pass filters. And then at which point the text blindly counted the nuclei in areas selected by the dermatopathologist on the h &E. These areas were located with a DAPI filter and a high power, either 64 or 100X. The technicians um, counted 30 nuclei, so 10 nuclei in three separate regions. And the qualifications for inclusion to the study include um, no nuclear overlap, there had to be adequate signal intensity, and the sample had to have at least greater than 20 nuclei. And what they found using the, in the first training set, the cohort one, these are the probes that teased out that had the allowed the best distinction between nevi and melanoma. And so this was the, the initial panel they kind of put together here, 11Q in green, 6P, 6Q in centromere 6, right? And they calculated average signal number per nucleus, percent gain, percent loss, percent relative gain, and percent relative loss. And basically um, using um, this, the second training set, they are able to come up with this, this, this value that basically 30, if you have 38% of the nuclei containing more than two signals for 11Q, it's melanoma, right? Melanomas also have greater than 55% of the nuclei containing more uh, 6P25 than centromere 6, and greater than 40% of nuclei containing fewer 6Q than centromere 6. So you see here, this is why that, that centromere enumeration probe is important to kind of have an understanding of for gains and losses. And then using this information, looking at cohort three and four, which was, um, you know, bona fide nevi and melanomas, as well as the ambiguous lesions with follow-up data, they concluded that basically there's a high sensitivity and specificity for distinguishing melanoma from nevus. 86.7 sensitive, 95.4 specific. And also what's very interesting in the study is that the met um, metastasis-free survival for the histopathologically ambiguous lesions without with, with follow-up or outcome data showed the base a drastic difference between the fish negative and fish positive tumors. Okay. So it's very kind of reassuring and exciting that you know this test may be, you know, may be useful as an adjunct for identifying malignant melanomas. And this is a nice picture here on Dr. Bussam's uh, review paper that he uh, published uh, a couple years ago. There's a normal cell here. You can see there's two copies of each color, whereas a melanoma. You, know, you can see here there's multiple gains in RREB1, okay, that's 6P. Um, there's also gains in CCND1, which is a, um, 11Q. So other investigators actually reported similar fish results when they try to kind of replicate this, this data. Um, and, you know, and the sensitivity and specificity is all kind of within the same relative span here. 85% uh, sensitive here, 90% specific. 94% sensitive, 94% specific, 82% um, sensitive, and 98% specific. And this paper here actually looked just looked at melanomas only, uh, 500 of them, and they actually found that 83.8% of melanomas were fish positive, which is you know interesting or, or you know reassuring. But is this as good as it gets? Well, the sensitivity for the melanoma fish test that that probe set that was put together. Um, 
only has a 70% sensitivity for spithoid lesions. And that's actually the diagnostically most challenging, right? Or ambiguous category. So 70% is really not good enough. I mean, you know, 30% of melanomas it's gonna miss. All right, that's just, that's just too, that's too high. Um, additionally, are there any other markers associated with aggressive biological behavior? Again, is there a fish, you know, um, um, you know, profile or chromosomal profile that's associated with, uh, that, that's, that's prognostic, essentially. Do we have that? And also, lastly, are there any outside the box applications that we'll touch on? So, for Spitz lesions, um, going back even to 2005, this paper here tried to stratify Spitz with melanocytic lesions and look at um, oncogenic driver mutations. Is there a difference between oncogenic driver mutations and Spitz nevi and Spitzoid melanoma? They use PCR for BRAF, NRAS, and HRAS. And they stratify their lesions, you know, pretty much in a standard way, you know, benign Spitz nevus, atypical Spitz tumor, the suspected Spitzoid melanoma, probably like a high risk, will be analogous to a high risk Spitz tumor, Spitzoid melanoma, and then lastly, Spitzoid melanomas that metastasized. Use the standard criteria that we use to kind of distinguish between these different categories. And what they found was interesting. So the benign spitzoid lesions lacked BRAF or NRAS mutations. And 29% um, of just benign spitz nevus had HRAS, and 14% of the low risk atypical spitz tumors had um, HRAS mutations. What happened? Ah, we're good. Okay. Um, Whereas the lesions that were high risk or melanoma or metastasized lacked HRAS, but instead had NRAS and BRAF mutations, like, like conventional melanomas, basically, okay? And even going back to 99, you know, Bastion had shown through various, uh, through CGH technology, that benign spitz nevi, um, majority of them don't have any chromosomal abnormalities, okay? Some can have um, gains in 11P, which we already discussed that numerous times. And spitzoid melanomas, though, tend to have deletions in 9P, 92% of them, okay? And that's very important. So for the diagnostic distinction, distinction of spitz nevus from spitzoid melanoma, maybe the addition of 9P21 may be beneficial, okay? The, that's the, 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 the CD, CDKN2A gene, which uh, corresponds to P16 tumor suppressor. So apparently this is very important for spitzoid lesions in particular. And so in this paper here, uh, they basically just looked at 9P21 just by itself, outside of the, the, the combined probe set, just 9, 9P21 in isolation, looking at melanomas and nevi, and they identified a cutoff of 10 cells with homozygous deletions to distinguish between uh, melanoma and nevi. And then when they validated that, okay, in their validation cohort, they found that just loss of 9P21, okay, homozygous deletion of 9P21 was 33% sensitive and 100% specific for melanoma. That's just one marker alone. Obviously, sensitivity is limited, but you can now add that, okay, to, to the fish panel. And when they applied 9P, 9P21 um, probe to spitzoid melanomas, okay, they found that basically uh, homozygous deletion of 9P21 was present in 11 of 27 cases or 41%. And when you combine 9P21 with the standard pre-existing melanoma fish test, the combined sensitivity jumped from 70% to 85%. And in fact, 26% of cases that were negative by my melanoma fish test were positive by 9P21. So therefore the 9P21 you know, probe um, you know, maybe highly complementary to standard melanoma fish assay, especially for spithoid melanomas. That's what we have. That's we have that probe added to our set um, at, at Mount Sinai for um, for fish testing. Uh, this is a nice picture here from Dr. Busam's review article here. It just shows you a spithoid melanoma. There's an absence of maturation with dermal descent. And you can see basically these, a lot of these cells lack, uh, are missing, have homozygous deletion of 9P21. So, um, Basically, you know, the idea is they want to tweak these probe sets, right, to get a higher sensitivity and a better specificity. You know, how can we tweak this? And so in this paper, also by Jeremy, um, they basically tried to tweak the probe set and added 9P21, removed 6Q, which was the MIB, MYB uh, um, of gene, and added 8Q as well. And what they found was that when they did that um, and tested that on their validation set, 
sensitivity jumped to 94% and specificity to 98%. So this is, this is pretty good here, right? So what about behavior? Are any of these probe combinations prognostic? Well, turns out the copy number gains in 11Q and 8Q are predictive for metastatic disease. Um, and interestingly, um, independent studies have shown that 8Q has prognostic value in uveal melanomas. But this kind of makes sense because gains in AQ are associated with amelanotic nodular melanomas. And so, I mean, even on the h &E microscope, I mean, we, we, we can just tell off the bat, I mean, this is a bad melanoma. I don't need H8 an AQ <laughs> gain to tell me this is going to behave aggressively. AQ is, a, it's, it, like AQ is where MIC is, uh, is located. So again, this really um, aggressive, potent oncogenic driver that induces an anaplastic cytomorphology, right? So, but AQ... Um, gains have been associated with aggressive behavior in amelanotic nodular mel melanoma phenotype um, and infrequent association with precursor nevus. And in this study here, they looked at um, 144 melanomas that were thicker than two millimeters. And they compared the development of metastatic disease and melanoma-specific mortality, as well as relapse-free and disease-specific survival between fish positive and fish negative cases. And they found that the risk of metastasis or melanoma-related death was higher in patients with fish positive primary tumors compared to fish negative. And this fish status remained prognostically significant even after adjustment for other known prognostic parameters like ulceration, mitotic activity, okay? So even regression. So what about outside the box applications for using fish, okay, for, for, for melanoma? What about microstaging of primary melanoma tumors? Now, when a melanoma is de novo, the entire thing is obviously melanoma, um, you know, measuring a breast load thickness is not a, not a problem. It's pretty straightforward, right? And breast load thickness has been shown to be the most important, um, um, pro, uh, most important marker for, for, um, for staging. And... Um, but what do you do when you have a melanoma that's arising within a pre-existing nevus, say a compound nevus? You may have melanoma in situ, but the component that's in the dermis might be benign nevus. Are you going to overcall and call the whole lesion melanoma and overmeasure and therefore overstage this lesion? It can be very, you know, difficult. I mean, how, what are you using to, to distinguish between what's benign and malignant? Just cytomorphology alone, okay? So again, there's a tendency to kind of, you know, um, you know, overmeasure the thickness, okay, or overestimate. The, the thickness of these tumors. And so maybe we can use fish for microstaging. So like here's a paper here, for example, you can see that you know, the, the superficial portions of the melanoma here have gains um, in, in chromosome seven, multiple copies here, whereas the part, the portion in the dermis um, is just benign, just benign dermal nevus. You have only have nice two copies, right, per cell, see that? So in theory, and it's not, we don't currently use this routinely, but conceptually that is a potential application for using fish is to kind of increase the accuracy of the um, breast loaf, um thickness measurement. So excuse me, so that means that the lower part is uh, not not to be measured for, for thickness of the melanoma? Yeah, you would measure, you would just measure down, I mean, again, I guess theoretically it's, it'd be probably difficult, but it's probably more accurate than just measuring the whole thing. The idea is you'd measure down to where the copy number changes stop in those cells. And again, remember, you can always kind of overlap the two, you can kind of compare VHD with the fish, right? Because it's, it's it's like an in situ test, right? You can actually see it on the glass side. It's not grind and fine like CGH. All right, so some caution in, in regards to fish, some limitations to using fish in clinical practice. Not all melanomas are fish positive. And that's because, again, we, we have a limited probe set we're using, okay? So fish target specific chromosomes and therefore fish negative unequivocal malignant melanomas with documented adverse outcomes may also contain chromosomal aberrations, just not the ones we're testing for, okay? And furthermore, not all melanomas need to be associated with copy number changes. Additionally, benign nevi may have a positive fish result on very rare occasion. But in most cases, this is actually probably most likely due to incorrect interpretation of the test, as, as well as imperfect diagnostic fish criteria. So, you know, whenever we hear the term molecular, our brain really just thinks that this thing is like, you know, um, you know, the, it's the, 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 the subjectivity that's, you know, I guess it chronically plagues, you know, those, you know, the H&E morphologists like us, right, um, is removed by molecular pathology. But in fact, when you're, you're interpreting fish results, there's a lot of subjectivity as to 
what what you know what cells qualify for a gain or a loss, right? So there can be there can be a lot of inter observer tech variability in terms of getting your fish counts. So and very, therefore variability between different laboratories using the same probes. Also, to keep in mind that focal assessment versus random assessment, you know, the pathologist is like circling an area of, of you know, of, of concern, may result in cherry picking of abnormal nuclei. And then also, while spitz nevi are usually fish negative, a significant subset of spitz nevi are tetraploid, which may lead to false positive enumeration. And so tetraploidy is ap uh, apparent when there are four copies per nucleus of any chromosome tested. And the issue here is basically whether to discount tetraploid nuclei, and this is not always straightforward, okay? So what do you do when you have three copies, okay? Is that a true gain, or is this a tetraploid cell where one of the nuclei or one of the chromosomes has been truncated or chopped off just through, you know, sectioning of the tissue? Again, you know, a cell is a sphere. We're looking at cut sections through that. Maybe just the blade chopped off a portion of the chromosome we're looking at, what we're, we're looking for. So therefore it can affect that your overall counts. And tetraploid just kind of makes things more complicated. However, there are rare true fish positive unequivocal benign nevi that have been documented, okay, histopathologically and clinically. And this is not really surprising, I guess, if you really think about it. I mean, we know that benign spitz nevi can have gains in chromosomes, so why can't other forms of benign nevi? I mean, it's just reassuring that it's, it's, it's an uncommon phenomenon, right? But you know you can't make this dogmatic and you know this kind of um, black and white concept. And this really kind of highlights the inherent limitations to the specificity of empirical thresholds or cutoff values. Now the use of CGH in clinical practice. CGH is currently the most widely used tool for problematic spitzoid melanocytic proliferations. Um, it can be applied to archival material, paraffin embedded. And again, remember this is grind and fine technology, and you can see here basically a nice. Um, you know, dermal nevus, where this is a melanoma here. And you can see, you know, this, you know, the control and the tumor nicely line up, whereas obviously the melanoma has gains and losses compared to the, the mapped control. See that? So we know there's, there's, you know, numerous chromosomal aberrations in this proliferation here. And so while the vast majority of melanomas show chromosomal aberrations detectable by CGH, occasionally cases can be CGH negative. Remember, and this actually is due to you have to have a large number of chromosomal, the, the chromosomal aberration has to be present in a large number of cells to be detected by CGH. Remember, there's limited sensitivity. And detection of a copy number change in a single chromosome should not be regarded as, de as definite proof for malignancy. Remember, spitz nevi, benign tumors that we know documented that do not behave in an aggressive fashion, can have gains in 11p and losses of chromosome three. So just one chromosome alone by CGH is just not enough to, to push something over the edge. Another limitation of CGH is that you can't distinguish between heterozygous and homozygous deletions. And that's very important, right? I mean, if you've got one copy left of a tumor suppressor, you can just upregulate that one allele, you know? So you actually will maybe you could still have intact tumor suppressor function. Um, and so it's difficult. You, know, you, you really want to have both copies deleted for you to be really concerned. Right, to have complete loss, obviously, of that tumor suppressor. So while homozygous deletions of 9P21 tends to be a much more specific finding for melanoma, the loss of a single copy can be seen in both melanoma and in benign nevi. And so those cases, basically, if you get a 9P21 spike on your CGH, you should go forward with fish to confirm to see if it's loss of one copy or loss of both copies. All right, last slide. So. And so, in summary, cytogenetic findings need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis and taking into account um, specific chromosomal alterations that are present, the clinical setting, you know, where is the tumor arising, the location, light microscopic findings, what's the morphology, and the terms immunohistochemical and clinical um, findings. Okay? And so the second talk I have, I don't know if you guys want to um, schedule it later, but it's on like gene expression profiling. Sure. Um, yeah.